thanks for listening to me. I should warn you that I wrote this presentation two days ago on the train on the way here, suddenly had some rethoughts, so I apologise now if it's a bit scrambled. <laughs> um, hopefully it will make some sense. And I think I'm already picking up on some of the themes that Cara just mentioned. Um, Cara also raised a lot of questions. Uh, I don't have answers to the questions. Um, I think I have more questions. But here we go. Um, the evidence in my presentation has mostly come from a literature review that I'm doing for my current PhD research. Um, and my research is looking at the relationship between the profession and sort of community or amateur archaeology. Um, archaeology has spent the best part of the last 100 years defining itself as a profession. This requires several stages, and the most recent one being the chartering of the Institute for Archaeologists. As archaeology has gone through this process, it's justified its increasing control and management of the archaeological resource as being on behalf of the public and um, for the public benefit. And as this professionalisation has progressed through post-processionalism and other things, um, it has emerged that it wasn't enough to manage on behalf of the public. Um, the public wanted more, the archaeology had to be shared. All these jobs are coming up um, as sort of public archaeologists. Whilst archaeology had been focusing on this development, community archaeology or amateur archaeology was uh, continuing. It's always been around um, and it was just sort of plodding along quite happily, minding its own business, doing its own thing, interacting with the profession when it made sense. I'm defining community archaeology here um, quite strictly as archaeology by the people, for the people. Um, bottom-up style projects, um, people researching archaeology because they want to um, and where they maintain a significant amount of control over the project. Um, and this may or may not be in partnership with professionals. Britain is unusual, there's no actual legislation um, preventing this, providing it's not occurring on scheduled ancient monuments um, and of course landowners give consent. This means that the profession has never really had full control um, due to various factors, um, including political agendas, funding associated with that, uh, stimulation through education, and this lack of prevention, community archaeology has significantly expand, expanded in recent years. So we've now got this situation where we've got these two things coexisting. Um, they have matured alongside each other in a potentially harmonious relationship, but it's not completely harmonious. Um, nothing is ever perfect, and a lot of people have a lot of problems <coughs> with this. Um, archaeology is not simple. <coughs> there are many different factors within it and many different individuals with all their different viewpoints. Community archaeology is the same, so it's going to be kind of complicated. <coughs> the issue that they're debating and fighting over is actually control over the archaeological resource. Um, both these parties think it's important, they want to research it, they want to maintain it, they don't want to do anything detrimental to it. <coughs> now, I've been starting to think about how other professions manage these kind of relationships. In ecology is one who does it, well they have a lot of volunteers that work with sort of ecological projects. Um, however, their relationships are not harmonious particularly. At least this is what my colleagues tell me in uh, my current office. Um, they all complain about how volunteers <coughs> are taking over the jobs and how um, you go out and do, a lot of the people I've been talking to about this are into maritime stuff, and they go out and do dives, um, thinking about recording coral. Um, that could easily be paid for and done by professionals, but volunteers end up doing it because there's so much demand. Some of the volunteers are brilliant. Some of the volunteers aren't good at all. They don't get the buoyancy right. They end up um, not only not recording the coral very well, but actually damaging it in the process. I think we can see here where there might be some parallels with archeology. span um, However, in ecology, a lot of the other areas are legislated 
it's actually quite hard for kind of community groups to form in the same way that they form in archaeology. Um, and I think there's a, a potential lesson to be learned there. Whereas if we were to legislate against it, we might drive it underground, we might make it more um, harmful. And I think if people still want to do it, they'll find ways of doing it. And is that going to threaten employment? By the way, these are just questions that I'm raising. They're not necessarily how I feel. <clears throat> so I've been looking at what the community say about this relationship and what the profession say. Um, one of the issues that repeatedly comes up is communication. We're all bad at it. Um, I think it's known that in any relationship, communication will make or break it, whether that's a personal one or a family one or a professional one. If you don't talk to each other, you're in trouble. The community complain that professionals don't share information. They complain that um, <coughs> contracting or commercial archaeology just um, deposit things in the HCR, sometimes several years after they've done the work. Um, they have these sort of closed doors, no one's allowed on site. The defence to this, of course, is that commercial companies have clients that they have to respect and that they um, who their first loyalty is to. And if they don't want the archaeology shouting about, there's nothing they can do about it. The community also finds that they have fairly inconsistent support um, from professionals. Um, in particular, one example um, is curators or local authority archaeologists. Some areas they're brilliant, some areas they're not so good. In some areas you get one who's brilliant and others aren't very good. Now, again, the defence for this is that not everyone's good at it, not everyone wants to do it, not every job description will allow it. And even though you may be, uh, or think of yourself as a curator, sometimes you have ability in your job role, and sometimes it's just not possible. But of course this works the other way around as well. <laughs> the profession um, complain that community groups don't always tell curators what they're doing. They don't deposit always in the historic environment record and they don't publish. Um, we, I hope all of us in this room know that actually some community groups do publish, they do deposit in HDR and they do work, work very closely with curators <coughs> and other professionals. <coughs> so the point of mediation um, which is what I'm sort of proposing here, um, is to get people communicating. And now that we've established that we don't do that very well, there are other issues that we also don't communicate over. Standards and training. Professionals complain that community standards are low. Actually, sometimes they're appalling. Sometimes the professional standards are appalling. Sometimes community standards can be very, very high. <coughs> Um, but the general impression is that to be a professional you've often got a one degree, two degrees, three degrees. Um, you've been through years of training. As uh, an amateur or someone who's come through a community group, you may also be very, very good, but your training has come in a different manner. You've paid a lot less for it. You might have spent a lot less time doing it. Um, and this can create what I'm kind of comparing to, you know, I don't know if you've been in this situation where you've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend and they earn three times the amount that you do. I suspect being archaeologists most of us feel this. Um, and at home, my other half is an archaeologist, by the way, um, there can be a bit of a, not quite a power imbalance, but almost like an important imbalance. So. You know, you might try and do a bit of extra of the housework to make up for that. Um, if you're a stay-at-home parent, you know, you make sure that you do the looking after the kids. You kind of have to pull together in the relationship to, to make it work. Um, so I've been doing some research on uh, relationship advice websites. Um, <laughs> yes, my colleagues did question why I was doing this. Um, Where is this going, really? <laughs> um, 
Anyway, they have a whole series of suggestions. Um, we've already talked about communication, um, sharing our needs, budgeting. I don't think we necessarily need to budget, but we do need to work out what needs to be done. Um, research frameworks are actually, I think, potentially very helpful in this. And English Heritage, I know, have started to think about community perspectives um, and build that in. We'll have to see how that actually pans out. A reward system, I haven't quite worked that one out yet. I was wondering whether know, maybe after some joint training session, a trip to the pub is always a good idea. Um, but also um, readdressing the power balance in a way not to make one person have to feel that they're coming down or going up or anything like that, but just to just to get the communication going and to make us all feel like we're valued. Um, there were other grumbles between the community and the profession. Employment threat. I, have, I haven't felt it written down anywhere, but I have had people say to me, or oh, I don't like amateurs, <laughs> they might take our jobs. And I've, I've had people say that. The curators in theory should prevent this from happening. I do know of examples where it has happened though, where um, community or volunteers have taken on commercial contracts um, under the guise of sort of doing something commercially, but they're not necessarily paying everybody. They also say that they can do a better job because they can spend longer doing it, or they've um, got a bit more, yeah, they've got a bit more time, um, or they don't pay people, so therefore the money they do have can go a bit further. People have also grumbled that there is um, a lack of statutory protection over the archaeology, um, or majority of it, um, and if we highlight this to people, it's going to make the whole situation worse. And I guess that's only probably if you see it as a bad thing in the first place. But the counter argument to that, of course, is that increased awareness can also increase protection. So to switch to a different industry again, the catering industry. If you're a professional chef, you have all sorts of qualifications. But if you want to bake a cake for a charity or make jams, you don't have to go through any of those things. You don't have to label your jars at all, I found out. Um, but these two different things are filling different niches. They're filling different roles and different purposes. And I think you can see the same with community and professional archaeology. They're filling different niches. So, thinking about the future um, and this relationship and where do we go and how do we improve it, build on it, prevent it from falling apart, we need to um, think about how much control as a profession we are willing to relinquish. We can't control everything. Um, these community groups want to get involved and they have their place and their niche and we can work together to make that happen. We need to think about the fact that the discipline is quite fractured. Um, like Clara said actually we do have um, contractors, uh, curators, university-based, all these different types of archaeologists if we're not coming from the same perspective, how on earth can anyone expect to communicate successfully with us? There has been quite a lot of discussion and thought recently about the idea of uh, mediators, um, sort of community archaeologists or public archaeologists, that can do this liaising. I'm not completely convinced this is the best way forward. Um, because I think that we need perhaps a more holistic approach. Um, we actually need to build better communication channels into everything that we do. Not to say that um, we don't have existing communication channels, we just need to make them work a bit better. Hmm. Um, so I don't think that a divorce between these two groups is imminent. Um, I don't think we want to separate, I think that would actually be a really bad idea. Um, I definitely don't think we want to legislate. 
because it would only make things worse. I think we need to communicate um, in order to establish this balance of power. Um, and communication should also address some of those other underlying issues. And we do need to address these issues. Otherwise, I can see a long, protracted battle between the two. Um, it's been going on for quite a while already. I don't think it should continue into the future. I think what we need to think about is who usually loses out in divorce. People often say it's the children. I'm guessing our children is the archaeology. Um, I don't think we should let the archaeology suffer. I think we need to communicate, I think we need to talk to each other, re-establish or establish um, a balance of control and then hopefully, that my references by the way, um, divorce is not imminent. Thank you.